Thank you. you. May be seated this morning. God is good, and all the time. Glad that you chose to worship with us today. My name is John, and I am uh, blessed to serve as a pastor here. And want to welcome you. Thank you for being here. And if uh, my wife Joy and I have not had a chance to meet you, uh, we will be in the foyer right after the service, and uh, just have a gift and want to get to know you. And thank you for uh, being here uh, today. So uh, before we get started in our message today, I have a really quick short video and and a quick announcement that I want to give you guys. So if you uh, draw your attention to the screen. Walking billboard. I got my Kilimanjaro hat on. I got my Ask Me About Kilimanjaro shirt on it as I worked out and trained today. Hey, we always think, how can I be a part of something great? Here's how. You can join me on the adventure, this expedition to Summit Kilimanjaro. It's a climb for a cause. Hey, if you wanna be a part of helping educate high school kids in Kenya, Africa, if you wanna be a part of helping feed impoverished kids in Ethiopia, if you wanna be a part of training and leading and developing leaders, young adults in Ohio and in the US, hey, join the expedition of Kilimanjaro. I wanna invite you to be a part of it. The information will be in the link here below. Uh, What you need to know is this, Quick Roofing has funded my entire trip. Thank you for their generosity. And so any sponsorships or donations or prayers that you send are gonna go directly to the kids. Help us help kids. We're rescuing kids from the grip of poverty through MANA Worldwide. Hey, join me on this expedition. And by join me, I don't mean go with me, okay? Yeah. I mean, if you want to, I don't think it's too late, uh, but hopefully you've been training a little bit for it. But uh, myself and, and Steve Switzer down here, you want to wave at everybody in case you don't know Steve, and then Andrew even over there uh, with MANA Worldwide. Andrew, you want to wave at us? Some of the new people may don't know who you are, but Andrew's the vice president of MANA Worldwide, and, and Steve is and Shelly are directors over Africa with MANA Worldwide. And so the three of us from Hallmark, we're going to be representing you as we try to summit as we plan, as we will summit Kilimanjaro uh, in October. And I wanted just to make you aware, some of you have been asking questions, well, how can we be a part of it? Uh, This uh, Earlier this month in our monthly board meeting, our board uh, decided to sponsor one of the campsites, uh, which is a $7,000 donation to help those kids. And by sponsorship, it, it doesn't go to us, it's going directly to The kids, it's just a way to be involved. And so if you would like to help or be a part of giving to these kids, and so again, it's the the high school, Valerie McMillan High School in Kenya that the money's going towards. It's also going to a Mana Nutrition Center in Ethiopia. uh, And then some of the money will also go to a leadership training center in Ohio for uh, college age students here in the US. And so if you'd like to give here through the church, you can give in your normal way of giving and then just add on the, the memo or on your other, if you've got a check or the drop-down menu, just write Kilimanjaro, okay? Uh, the way that I was told to remember this is kill a manjaro, but I don't really like using that word when I'm about to go, all right? So you could just write K-I-L-I if you want. We'll figure it out, all right? If you go to manaworldwide.com and then just forward slash K-I-L-I, all the information is there as well. But I would invite you, if you can't give, to give to these kids, what you can do is pray, all right? Pray for us as we make this journey and also really the goal is to raise awareness uh, for impoverished kids all over the world uh, and obviously to raise money for them. And so it's 19,000, I can't read that, 341 feet, I should know that. So our goal is to raise $193,041, all right? So if you can help us do that again, it's all going uh, to the kids. Um, Let me reset. God is good? And all the time? It's like in my brain. Now I can start preaching. We've done what we're supposed to do, all right? Hey, if, how many of you were here last Sunday? Who was here last Sunday? 
Wasn't last Sunday an amazing Sunday? Uh, I know you've, I know a lot's happened. You maybe forgot, but I have not forgot. The students uh, led us. Of course, we had uh, a kids get ba- uh, one of the kids get baptized. A couple kids who had finished New Believers class got to celebrate them, and then our students led us in worship. Uh, the students also gave testimonies, and Carlos, our student pastor, preached. And didn't the students do an amazing job? I, yeah, you can give them a hand. I was. I was so impressed with their maturity. And here's two things that jumped out at me that was kind of a theme that I noticed in what they said. Number one was that these students were focused and are focused on reading their Bible. Did you catch that? It was like we were on a mission trip and we got to read the Bible and study together. And we were at school, I mean, just over and over this theme that they were studying the Bible. And I'm, I, I like you, I believe you are like me, that I'm convinced that uh, the world and our students more than ever need to know the Word of God. Because we live in a crazy world, don't we? We don't have to get into all the specifics, but can we agree our world's a little bit nuts? And, and the only thing that's going to ground us, and specifically as we think about our students is the word of God, right? So I was so encouraged that they just focused on the word of God. Another theme that kept coming out was that they were uh, inviting their friends to church and they were having gospel conversations with friends at school or at work. And several of the students that got up here and spoke last Sunday were a direct result of somebody in the student ministry inviting them to church. And then they gave their life to Jesus. That's pretty awesome. Um, And it was a challenge to us. So as I was thinking about this all week, you know, what a great opportunity. You have a card right there by you, right? The students have modeled it for you. Let's go out and, and invite someone to join us for Friend Day so they can find and follow Jesus. So last week, interesting enough, about two weeks ago on a Wednesday, typically my schedule on Wednesday is I spend most of the entire day on Wednesday in my office And I'm usually like finalizing and typing up the entire transcript of the message coming up for Sunday. That way, everyone that's got to print stuff and create slides for the sermon notes and the connect group leaders who are going to teach that, they they all want me to get done by Wednesday. I mean, they probably prefer me to get done by Monday, but that's not going to happen. You know, I know pastors that are like six months in advance on their sermons. And I'm like, I think you're just crazy. But anyways, I I guess it'd be cool. And so uh, last Wednesday ago, I was actually a, a week ahead. It's like, this is going to be awesome. I'm going to be a week ahead. I've been studying Matthew 25. We're talking about biblical stewardship. No greater passages than Matthew 25, the, the parable of the talents. And I mean, I've been listening. I've been studying. And I'm sitting there typing away. I've been at it all morning. And then Carlos walks by my office. And I'm like, hey, Carlos, what are you preaching this Sunday? And he said, Matthew 25, parable of the talents. He got all excited. He's telling me all about it. I'm like, shoot. (laughs) I didn't even tell him. He just walked off and I delete, 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 and I started over. But he gave us a good introduction to this idea of biblical stewardship. Here were the three things that he left us with last week when when talking about the parable of the talents. Remember, the owner goes on a long journey. He gives one person five talents, one two, and one one. Two of them do the right thing, and they're well done, faithful uh, servant, and the other one's like, you lazy, wicked person, right? And so what he's told us in that story was three things. This is it. God is a wise giver, right? God is a wise giver. God doesn't make mistakes. Do you agree with that? Number two, we should be smart stewards. So God is the wise giver. We, are, we should be smart stewards. And number three, God expects us to grow what we've got. So this is the general principles of, of stewardship. And so as we were talking about it in staff meeting on Tuesday, I think I finally told Carlos, you stole my sermon, but it's okay. And so we were talking about stewardship and we began to think, what, I wonder who actually could define what steward is or stewardship. It's not a word we use a lot. And and then I begin to just kind of look at different passages of scripture. Look at 1 Corinthians 4, verse 1. It says, it'll be on the screen, let a man so consider us, Paul talking, as servants of Christ and stewards 
All right? Stewards. We are stewards of God. Now, let me give you a couple of definitions of this idea of steward. First is like the English, you know, Merriam Webster's definition the careful and responsible management of something entrusted to one's care. The careful and responsible management of something entrusted to one's care. All right, now let's look at the Greek dictionary, all right? Now, I'm not going to even try to say the Greek word here. Uh, You can just pronounce it in your head if you want. But here's the Greek uh, dictionary definition. One who has authority and responsibility for something, one who's in charge of, one who's responsible for, or the administrator, or manager. I think maybe for our context, manager may, may make a little more sense to us. It may be uh, uh, more understandable. I understand what it means to manage. So I want us to, kind of in addition to what Carlos mentioned last week, I want to give you three aspects of a steward or a manager, okay, based on these definitions, all right? So three things, re- really quickly. A steward or a manager oversees what belongs to another. A steward or a manager oversees what belongs to another. Number two, a steward carries authority to manage what he has been entrusted with. Number three, a steward is responsible. In other words, he or she will give an account to the owner. And and you saw those three principles played out in the parable of the talents last week, right? So two of the Two of the the managers, the stewards, they increased what the owner had given them by putting themselves to work. When the owner came back to give an account, he said, well done, good and faithful servants. The one who hid the talent and did nothing with it, he did not advance the, the, the goals, the money of the owner, and he was called wicked and lazy. There's an account Now, I want us to to think about this in another light. Let me read for you the rest of 1 Corinthians 4, verse 1, because we left off a portion of it. Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards. What are we managing? What are we stewarding? The mysteries of God. So Paul is saying here that we are to manage, we are to be responsible for, we are to increase, we are going to give an account for what? How we manage the mysteries of God. And what is he talking about, mysteries of God? I think he's specifically talking about the gospel. What are we going to do and what are we doing and how are we managing the gospel? You see, we often say the gospel came to you on the way to someone else. The students modeled it for us last week that several of the students that got up here and gave their testimony, they found Jesus because someone invited them to find Jesus. But I want you to wrestle with that this morning as we think through this. How well are you managing, how well are you stewarding what Paul termed here as the mysteries of God, the gospel God so loved the world, he gave his only son, that whoever believes him will not perish, but have everlasting life. For by grace you have been what? Saved by faith. It's a gift of God. It's not of works. That's the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, you heard the gospel, you received the gospel, and you were saved by the gospel. And so I want us this morning, now I know probably what you were thinking when you saw that first screen go up, biblical stewardship. Maybe you were handed the sermon note today and you saw on the very top, biblical stewardship, and you were thinking, oh, it's a holiday weekend and we're going to talk about money. (laughs) We're not really going to talk about money, okay? Okay. If God brings it into your mind, maybe he's wanting to speak to you about money. But we're we're talking from a more of a holistic perspective of how am I, how are you, how are we collectively as Hallmark Church stewarding and managing the mystery of the gospel? In fact, Peter talked about this as well. In 1 Peter 4.10, it says this, as each one has received a gift, 
right? When you gave your life to Christ and you placed your faith in Jesus for salvation and you received eternal life, you were also giving spiritual gifts. As each has received a gift, so he's talking to followers of Jesus. It says, minister to one another as good, what's the word there on the screen? Stewards. What are we stewarding? Of the manifold grace of God. Again, the gospel message. That everyone, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's the good news of the gospel, isn't it? So I want you, as we walk through this this morning, to consider and to examine and to process How well are you managing the mysteries of God? How well are you managing the manifold grace of God? Are you managing and stewarding the gospel well? Now, I want to think that in context of our church well as well. So again, this is kind of review for us today, but we understand what is the mission of of the church. When I, when I say the church, I'm not specifically speaking of just Hallmark Church, but the church, all followers of Jesus. What's the mission of the church? Jesus made it very clear. Disciples make disciples. Like the goal of the church, go and make disciples of all nations. That's the goal of followers of Jesus, right? Matthew 28 or Acts chapter 1. But then we think about in terms of For our church, like we understand the mission of the church, make disciples who make disciples. The vision of Hallmark, we've kind of phrased it in one short term, right? Leading people to find and follow Jesus. Again, I keep going back to it, but it was such an encouragement last week to hear 16 and 17 year old students who've taken time to invite a friend to find Jesus. And what about me? What about you? We think about finding, leading people to find Jesus. That's anything that you or I do that's evangelistic, right? Inviting someone to connect with Jesus. We think about this following Jesus. That's anything we do that would encourage someone to take their next step of faith in discipleship. Find and follow Jesus. Again, by way of review, our biblical, our, our Hallmark's core values, the Hallmark's of Hallmark. We want to be biblically driven, personally involved, radically generous, and outwardly focused. So you guys can help me today by self-evaluating, and then maybe you can help us as a church that we self-evaluate. How well this Hallmark Church, how well you can put your name in this, how well does John Haley manage and steward the mysteries of God, the manifold grace of God. And I believe that as followers of Jesus, God has given followers of Jesus the mission to make disciples of all nations. We just said that. But listen to this statement. God has chosen the local church as the primary vehicle for exporting the gospel and discipleship of all nations. This is why I think it's very important for anyone, if you have joined a local church, that you are committed to that local church. This is the avenue, this is the way that God has chosen to reveal himself to the world is through the working of the local church. This is why core values are important. This is why a teaching and being discipled and growing in your faith and getting into the word of God is important because it's important to God. So how many of you have have heard, let's say, more biblical stewardship sermons on money than you really would care to count? Anybody like that? All right. Everybody's like, I'm not sure if I should raise my hand on that. Sounds kind of judgy, right? How many of you heard these three words when talking about stewardship, time, talent, and treasure. How many of you heard those three words, all right? That's less ominous to ask the question, right? I should ask, how many of you have thought Pastor John has preached a terrible message? All right, some of you. That's what that first question felt like after I asked it. I was like, that is 
kind of a terrible wording. Anyways, time, ta- so who's heard time, talent, and treasures? All right, and that's what I've heard, I guess, most of my life. Uh, this past week, I was, uh, well, actually it was a week ago when I was preparing for the week before, but then Carlos stole my message. But a few weeks ago, I heard this message and a guy added two more T's to this equation. Time, talent, treasure, temple, testimony. It's a little more like holistic thought of my entire life, everything about me, I should be managing and stewarding, leveraging to reach more people with the gospel. Not just my time, not just my talents, not just my treasure, but, but my, my body. And look what it says, my body, my mind, my testimony, my words, my action, my influence. So when you look at this list, I want you to think in your own life, is there an area in my life in which I'm maybe not managing well, I'm not leveraging the gifts and the abilities that God has given me well to advance the kingdom of God? You see, as a follower of Jesus, what we see in the scriptures is that, that they, they, they forsook all and they followed Jesus. That from that moment on, so it's, it's almost as these words that we maybe don't like to use, but this idea of the cost of discipleship or the idea of lordship, that God is Lord of all my life. And some of us in church, we've gotten really good at saying, well, yes, God is Lord of my treasure, but what about the other things? So in my, everything in my life, does God have ownership? Have I surrendered it back to God? And now understand, I'm going off a presupposition that maybe you don't have today. So let's clarify that for a moment. Here's what I believe, because in Genesis 1-1, it says, in the beginning, God, what? Created. And because he's the creator, he's the owner. He created everything. He owns everything. In fact, the psalmist said it this way in Psalm 24, 1 through 2. The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness. The world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. So maybe you don't have the same presupposition I do, but I'm going to convince you that you should. You're not the boss. Do you agree with that? Hmm, Maybe. Depends on the situation, right? Who's in control, you or God? Let's say it again. Who's in control, you or God? He's the owner of all. He's sovereign. Every, listen, in fact, the last two weeks we've quoted this verse and it wasn't in intentional or we didn't plan them at James 1.17, I think it is. Every good gift and every perfect gift comes from who? God, the Father above. Like everything, my gifting, my ability, you know, the ability to, to have a job, the ability to get up and work a job, the ability to go to work, all that was given to you by God. There's no self-made man. That's what our culture likes to say, right? No, everything belongs to to God. And so when we understand that God's the owner, I am the steward or the manager, it changes perspective on my time, my talent, my treasures, my temple, and my testimony. Everything that I have, everything that God has blessed me with, my giftings should be used and leveraged for the sake of the gospel. But is it? I'm going to answer for myself Remember the principle we learned last week, we're gonna give an account. This is why I think this quote has been um, just in my head for about a month now. And I know I've shared it with you before. I even shared it uh, this past Wednesday night in in Bible study by A.W. Tozer. And he says, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. When we think about stewardship, if we will understand that God is in control and I'm gonna give an account 
for how I manage everything. It will change my perspective. I want to illustrate this quickly just for a moment. So I've asked uh, Brett and his daughter Soria to, to come illustrate this. And, and uh, can we give a hand to Soria? Because I know it's going to be hard to come up here. Can we give her a hand? And uh, I, I wanted them to illustrate for us this principle that what I believe. So this, I don't know about you, but when I read this quote, it kind of it, it twists my mind a little bit. What does it really matter what I think about God? That's not the most important thing. God's the most important thing, right? This is kind of in my mind, got me a little fuzzy. So I thought I want to figure out a way to illustrate it. All right, come on up here, Soya. Let's give her another hand. Good job. Give me a five. All right, so what I've asked Brett and Soya to do is to illustrate this by, I'm asking Soya if I, now you don't know your dad as well as I know your dad, just to be honest with you. But I'm asking to see, would she, does she trust her dad enough to jump off this stage. How many of you would trust Brett to catch you? (laughs) Brett, can you, do you think he could catch me? No? (laughs) All right, so it's it's on you, so whenever you you trust, you you go for it. Yeah, all right. Oh, wait, put put her back up there. Sawyer, would, would you trust me to catch you? Okay, well, Sawyer, my heart is hurt just a little bit. That's okay. We can give her a hand for Chase Sawyer. Thank you, Brett. I thought there was about a 50-50 chance she would trust me, but it does illustrate. Do we, we've been asking these three questions all year. Right, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust the Lord with all your heart. Lean not in your own understanding, your own abilities, everything else. But in all your ways acknowledge him. He will direct your paths. Now, Sawyer had complete faith, I think, in her dad. Because she knows him. She trusts him. She didn't have so much faith in me because she knows me and because she doesn't trust me. I, was, I, I told her a story before church uh, when, when Brett, her dad, was a, a little boy. It's been about 20 years ago now. We were, in, we were in Belize on a mission trip, and we were out, and we were going to be snorkeling with stingrays and sharks. Anybody want to sign up for that? And so, you know, everybody's a little nervous, and they said, all right, when you jump into the water, be careful. I mean, there, you look in the water. Again, I'm going to step off this thing. When you look into the water, there's stingrays everywhere and sharks everywhere. And they said, now, the only thing you got to make sure you do is when you jump out of the boat, don't land on a stingray. Because if you land on a stingray and pin it to the floor, what's it going to do to you? All right, now how many of you can be more scared? Well, I'm, I'm, I don't care. I jump in, no problem. And as soon as I hit the water two people jump on my head. You know who it was? Brett. <laughs> Brett and Ethan. You know why they jumped on me? Because they, they were scared to death, right? The little boys. And I'm like, got these two kids. I'm like, get off me, you know. But it proves this principle. If, if I, th- so here's the three questions we've been asking all year, Right? Do I believe that God is good? Do I believe that God is in control? And will I trust him until he proves it? Those are tough questions. The first two seem fairly easy, right? Do you believe God is in control, yes or no? Do you believe God is good? And then the faith question, right? And this is, this is a daily question. Sometimes it's an hourly question. Sometimes it's a moment by moment question when you get the phone call, when you're sitting in the doctor's office. Am I gonna trust God until he proves it? So what I believe about God will impact how I manage 
and steward what he's given me. If I believe he's good and he's in control, well, then it's easy to say yes. I'll follow that guy anywhere. If I don't know if he's gonna catch me when I jump off the stage, no. This is why it's important for you to be in the word because the Bible reveals to us the goodness of God. Now, the last few minutes, you know, normally we, we kind of walk through a, a passage. Today's a little more topical in nature of our sermon, but I, I want you to turn to Luke chapter 10. And I've never heard this message preached uh, on stewardship until a few weeks ago. Again, when I was preparing for last Sunday and Carlos stole mine. I'm a little bitter about it, but I'll, I'll get over it. I, I heard a guy preach on this message, and he went to this passage of the Good Samaritan, and so we're gonna, we're gonna end this morning looking at three attitudes of the three characters in the story of the Good Samaritan. And so I want you to, as we read through the story and you think about these characters, specifically the thief and the religious leaders and then the Good Samaritan, I want you to think in terms of managing or stewarding my time, my talent, my treasure, my temple, my testimony. I want you to think in terms of how am I leveraging everything that God has entrusted to me for the sake of the gospel? How am I stewarding the mysteries of God, the manifold grace of God? And, and then we're gonna look at three attitudes and you can figure out which one best represents you. Verse number 25, Luke 10. Behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him saying, teacher, he's speaking to Jesus, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What is your reading of it? He answered and said, you shall love the Lord with all your heart, soul, strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. He said to him, you've answered rightly, do this and you will live. But he, the, the lawyer, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, well, then who is my neighbor? because he doesn't really want to love everyone. Then Jesus answered and said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. He fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, departed, leaving him half dead. Now by uh, chance, a certain priest came down the road, and when he saw him, he passed on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal, brought him to the inn, and took care of him. On the next day when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, take care of him, and whatever more you spend when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was a neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And he said, he who has shown mercy on him. Then Jesus said, go and do Likewise. And so I, I heard this, again, this is not original to me, but I, I heard these three uh, attitudes of these characters, and I want to share them with you. The first attitude is this, the attitude of the thief. What's yours is mine, and I will take it. What's yours is mine, and I will take it. And I think in my own life, and I want you to think in your own life, when we think about our time our talent, our treasure, our testimony, our temple. Is there an area in my life in which I'm robbing God? Now, if you're familiar with uh, stewardship sermons, you know, this is where everyone would turn to, to Malachi 3.8 and God asked the people, why are you robbing me? And they asked him back, how are we robbing you? And he said, well, you're robbing me in your tithes and your offerings. So specifically, that could be a way that, that I am robbing God and not being generous with my treasure. But I want us to think beyond that today. Are there areas in your life in which you have said, that's mine? God, I'm, I'm, taking, that, I'm taking that back. The, the second is the religious leaders. What's mine is mine and I'm gonna keep it. Is there an area in your life in which you are keeping from God? I think some of us have figured out maybe that we give God our treasure, 
but not our talents. In fact, I think in sometimes in church culture, people will give more so they don't have to feel obligated to serve. I think the reverse can also be true, that some decide I'm going to serve, but I'm not going to give. Is there an area in your life that you have not turned over to the Lord, your, your own body, your temple? There are things that you're doing with your body that are not honoring to God. God says your body as a follower of Jesus is the temple of God. Are there things that you're saying, no, this is mine. Keep your hands off. What's mine is mine, I'm going to keep it. Is there areas in your life currently? What about your testimony? The third one, Good Samaritan. What's mine is yours, and I will give it. And I love the story. He didn't just meet the needs that were present. He left money and said, I'll come back and give more. Radical generosity. You see, in order for this good Samaritan to be involved and to do what God had called him to do, it took every area of his life. It took time, took his talents, his treasure, his testimony, and his body, his temple. Which one most represents your attitude about managing and stewarding what God has entrusted to you. Specifically, we are talking about the gospel. The greatest treasure that you can give is the knowledge of Jesus Christ. How well are you, how well are we managing the gospel message? I want you just to close your eyes for a moment. And I want you just to process for for a moment in the quietness. Where are you at? Which which one of these five T words, right? Which one of these kind of stung a little bit? Which one of those did God say, hey, there you go. You have not surrendered that area of your life to me. You are not managing and leveraging all that I've given you for the sake of the gospel. What, what, is, what is that for you? Let the Holy Spirit just kind of, you, you lean into the Lord. God, what did, what did David pray? Search my heart, see if there's any wicked. God, reveal to me in what area of my life do I have an attitude of a thief In what area in my life do I have the attitude of the religious people? In what areas of my life should I be more like the Good Samaritan? In a moment, I'm going to pray and I'm going to have you stand. We're going to end the service worshiping through music. But if God has really spoken to you about an area of your life, you're welcome to just to stay seated at your seat and pray. You're welcome to come to the altar and pray. But I want you to just You have a conversation with God. Be open and honest with God. Lord, I thank you that you are the greatest giver. You gave us Jesus. Jesus humbled himself, became obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. And Lord, because of the gift of salvation, forgiveness, eternal life, the free gift. Lord, may that inspire, encourage, challenge, convict that we would be generous in all areas of our life for the sake of the gospel. We thank you for Jesus. I'm gonna ask you to stand with me. Again, if you wanna come and and pray, if you wanna just stay seated and pray, that's up to you. But let's stand and worship through music today.